The 1980s marked the pinnacle for the fantasy genre. Riding high on the boom of sci-fi films, partly fueled by the massive success of the Star Wars legacy and popular fantasy role-playing adventure board games like Dungeons & Dragons. The second half of the 20th century has seen filmmakers exploring modern fantasy themes with magic and mythical creatures and characters from the world of wizards and witches to heroes and villains notably influenced by J.R.R. Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings. Today, we're diving into the top 15 fantasy movies from the 80s, a time when magic ruled the screens and the hearts. But before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. The Princess Bride, 1987 The 1987 fantasy comedy The Princess Bride, directed by Rob Reiner, is a movie in which true love faces impossible odds and, as spoken by the great Chaucer, Amor vincit omnia, love ultimately triumphs. The story begins with a homesick kid reluctantly listening to his grandfather read him a tale of love and bravery. We meet the innocent farm lady Buttercup and the young farmhand Westley. They were deeply in love, but separated by fate. Poor but determined, Westley sails on a quest to seek fortune and marry his beloved. However, things went super south when Westley's ship was allegedly captured by the dread pirate Roberts, who had a thing for killing his prisoners. Heartbroken at the apparent death of her lover and with nothing to look forward to, Buttercup was forced into an engagement with the wicked prince Humperdinck. However, the marriage was interrupted when she was abducted by a group of outlaws. But soon, she was rescued by a mysterious pirate who is revealed to be none other than, and not so dead, Westley. However, the lover's reunion is cut short when Humperdinck recaptures Buttercup, which leads Westley to undertake another heroic quest. The Princess Bride's charm lies in the wide roster of folkloric wizards, princesses, and pirates. Since one feels like one has been transported back in time, it becomes easier to stay hooked. Needless to say, the movie mocks and satirizes archetypal fantasy tropes. I agree that the premise was essentially that of a damsel in distress, but it managed to remain witty, well-directed, and rounded with memorable and rather irreplaceable performances. Although upon its release, The Princess Bride received a lukewarm reaction and a modest opening at the box office, it eventually grew into a cult favorite. The movie has left a lasting impression on audiences and still makes many of us swoon over the love story at its heart. Sweetheart. The Little Mermaid, 1989. Produced and released by Walt Disney, The Little Mermaid is a musical animated film loosely based on a Danish fairy tale of the same name. Dissatisfied with her life in the undersea kingdom ruled by her father, King Triton, Ariel, a rebellious teenage mermaid, dreams of a life on land. She yearns to experience a new life above water among the humans, who are described by her father as barbaric fish eaters. However, nothing could dissuade or change Ariel's mind. On one of her visits, to the unexplored shore, the ginger mermaid falls for a human prince named Eric. Hopelessly head over heels in love with the mortal prince, Ariel strikes a dangerous deal with the cunning and wicked sea witch, Ursula. Ursula transforms Ariel into a human for three days, and in these three days, Ariel must receive the kiss of true love from Eric. However, if she fails to do so, she will again transform into a mermaid and will solely belong to Ursula. In exchange for transforming Ariel into a human, Ursula asks Ariel to give up her voice, which she does. However, unbeknownst to Ariel, Ursula has her own ulterior motives for helping her and eventually plans to overthrow Triton and claim herself as the queen of the ocean. The whole film is simply a thing of beauty. From the very first frame, it grasps the audience's attention with a musical score on the prince's ship and then introduces us to the kingdom of mermaids below the sea. The animation of the movie is pleasing to the eyes, especially the lush underwater scenes. Everyone involved in the film does a splendid job and is endearing. However, Sebastian, Ariel's friend, is one such character that stands out and adds humor and liveliness. All the songs are worthy of admiration, while the song Under the Sea is dynamic and cracks up the tempo. The script is witty, and as Ariel longs for freedom and a life of her own, 
We wish the same for her. The Little Mermaid is certainly one of Disney's best, along with Beauty and the Beast, Sleeping Beauty, and many others. The Neverending Story, 1984. Based on a novel of the same name and directed by Wolfgang Peterson, The Neverending Story is an epic fantasy that follows Bastian, a young, troubled boy still recovering from the loss of his mother. He is constantly bullied at school, and in one such instance, when he is fleeing from them, he finds refuge in a bookshop. The owner shows him a book with a peculiar title, The Never-Ending Story. Unable to resist the urge to read it, Bastian shoplifts the book, but leaves a note that reads that he will return the book after he finishes reading it. He begins reading the book in the school attic and is soon immersed in it. The book tells the story of the mystical kingdom of Fantasia, which is doomed and in dire need of a hero who can save it from its destruction. It can only be salvaged by a young warrior named Atreyu, who can only prevent the villainous dark force, the Nothing, from dooming the world. However, Atreyu alone cannot save the world and requires the help of an earthling boy. And before Bastian can grasp what's happening, he finds himself a part of the story, and the survival of the world lies on his young shoulders. Just as Bastian was pulled into the fantasy of Fantasia, the audience can't help but feel the same. The story is mystical yet simple. The scenery and settings are a feast for the eyes, while the music is spectacular. The costumes are gorgeous, and the special effects are equally worth praising. The world of Fantasia is beautifully crafted, while the strange creatures crawling the land look convincing as well. The acting is fantastic and spirited. The movie creates a sense of awe and wonder about the dark adventure a Treyu and Bastion are about to take. <laughs> the Secret of Nim, 1982. An animated dark adventure film directed by Don Bluth, The Secret of Nim was based on the children's novel Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim. It follows Mrs. Brisby, a widowed lonely mouse who lives with her children in a cinder block on the Fitzgibbon farm. Her family is threatened when the farmer decides to mow the farm which Mrs. Brisby calls home. Mrs. Brisby prepares to leave the field before the plowing time approaches. However, her son Timothy falls ill with pneumonia and hence cannot be moved, which forces her to look for other alternatives. Desperate to save his family from the impending danger just around the corner, Mrs. Brisby seeks advice from the Great Owl, a wise creature who advises her to seek aid from a group of mysterious rats who live under the rosebush outside the farmer's house. There, Mrs. Brisby meets the wise and mystical leader of the rats named Nicodemus, who tells her about her dead husband, Jonathan Brisby, who, along with other rats, was part of a series of experiments carried out by the National Institute of Mental Health, also known as NIM. These experiments enhanced the rats' intelligence and gave them the ability to read without being taught and understand complicated mechanics beyond their apprehensions. Going above and beyond reality, the animated film truly steers clear of stereotypical animations. Although it received moderate success at the box office, the movie was way ahead of its time. It has a deep and mature plot, yet the presentation is simple and engaging. It tells us an inspirational story of courage and perseverance, even in the most docile and meek rats. The animation is wonderful, gloriously rich, and leaves a lasting impact. The attention to every minute detail, whether Nicodemus's glowing eyes or the bright radiance for Mrs. Brisby, which evokes a feeling of resilience and sheer courage, is all done remarkably. The bright color palette dazzles throughout the movie, while there are a few tearjerker scenes that tug a little closer to our hearts. However, it's the endearing character of Mrs. Brisby for whom we all sit down and root. From a shy and naive widow, she transforms into someone who sheds all her layers of meekness and timidity to fully discover her true potential and remarkable inner strength, a lesson we can all learn from. Dragon Slayer, 1981. Co-produced by Disney, Dragon Slayer, directed by Matthew Robbins, is exactly what the film's title suggests. When a kingdom is terrorized by a 400-year-old dragon, 
the king makes a pact with the dragon to offer virgins to it in exchange for the dragon leaving the kingdom alone and at peace. Every year, the king holds a lottery involving all the virgins of the land. The unlucky virgin who loses the lottery is then sacrificed to the dragon as a peace offering. However, when the king's daughter learns that the lottery that chose the virgins was rigged to exclude rich families, the princess rigs the draw to choose her name. A devastated father then seeks the help of a young wizard, Galen, Galen, who forges a sword called the Dragon Slayer, using his dead master's magical amulet. And thus, Galen sets out to slay the beastly dragon in an attempt to save the next virgin in line, his beloved. While Disney co-produced the movie, it was far from a children's film. The film had gory violence and dealt with adult themes, yet it has made its mark as a classic. Although the plot of the movie is quite simple and straightforward, we don't always have to add complexities to make a masterpiece, and that's what Dragon Slayer is. Although simple in its treatment, the plot is very clever and executed brilliantly. The film is packed with magic, adventure, and a glimmer of hope that it will eventually end right for our young hero, who is out confronting his fate. The production and the way the movie is beautifully shot in scenic landscapes with black rock and gloomy moors add to the charm. However, it's the dragon that is worth every praise. Simple and plain in design, the dragon is one of the best special effects designs that came out of the 80s. The simplicity of its design adds to the creepiness and makes it all the more menacing as it annihilates everything standing in its path. The background score is fantastic and perfectly goes with the broody atmosphere. The film has notable performances and every character is praiseworthy. Despite being a simple film, Dragon Slayer has all the elements to make it a success and the movie won't let its audiences forget the image of a spine-chilling dragon emerging from the water behind our valiant hero. The Dark Crystal, 1982 Directed by Jim Henson and Frank Oz, The Dark Crystal takes place millions of years ago in a completely different timeline on the planet Thra, which has three suns. The planet was ruled by the race of Erskex, who were the guardians of the Crystal of Truth, which harnessed the light of the sun for a peaceful reign. However, the Erskex cracked the crystal and split it into two races, the gentle mystics and the wildlings and cruel beings named Skeksis. The crystal then turned into a dark crystal, and thus began a period of chaos and disarray. The barbarity of the Skeksis began when they drove away the mystics from the castle, which contained the now-shattered crystals. They particularly rained their wrath on the elf-like Gelflings because of a prophecy that predicted the end of the Skeksis and the restoration of the crystal at the hands of a Gelfling. Meanwhile, an orphan, Jen, is raised by the mystics after her parents were killed by Skeksis lackeys. Jen, our hero, believed to be the last Gelfling, is sent on a quest by her dying master to find the missing shard of crystal, heal it back, and make it whole once again. Jen undertakes a dangerous journey to find the missing piece of the Dark Crystal, which gives Skeksis immense power and puts an end to the wrath of Skeksis. But how can anything be smooth sailing for our luckless hero? With countless dangers, witches, and an almost impossible quest, Jen, a single Gelfling, may or may not be sufficient to bear the great burden of saving the world and restoring its balance. Despite the story being very simplistic in nature, the good mystics versus the evil Skeksis, the movie builds a world so engrossing that I personally want to be a part of it. Although the movie didn't do well commercially because it was released during the time E.T. was released, it didn't prevent Dark Crystal from being a fan favorite for years to come. Not one without flaws, but the movie achieves the perfect balance between a kid's movie as well as a fantasy adventure for adults. The representation of the villainous Skeksis is amazing. They not only look petrifying, but are also a savage race with a taste for blood. They suck the lives out of their victims, and how can one forget the genocide they committed against the Gelflings off-screen? An enthralling film where each character is developed with attention and richness. The puppetry department does a fantastic job with so many details put in. The settings and the world where the movie takes place are surrounded by creatures and animals that make you wish you were a part of them. The soundtrack uplifts the whole film, 
and the production design is immaculate and so rich that one wishes to see everything happen right in front of their eyes. All in all, it's an enjoyable hero's journey that also takes the audience on a mystical trip brimming with life and is an absolute treat to watch. Clash of the Titans, 1981. Loosely based on the ancient Greek myth of Perseus, Clash of the Titans is a fantasy adventure directed by Desmond Davis. A magnificent romantic adventure, Clash of the Titans is a coming-of-age movie. It follows an infant Perseus who, along with his mother, is locked in a coffin and cast into sea to their deaths after she angered the great gods. However, Zeus takes pity on the mother-son and washes them ashore on a marooned island. Perseus, after escaping his cruel fate, grows up on the island. When fate brings him to the city of Joppa, he learns about the curse on Princess Andromeda, who cannot marry her suitor until they solve a riddle concocted by the evil Calabas, the spoilt brat of the sea goddess Thetis. Although Perseus is successful in solving the riddle presented to him, Calabas has now turned into an ugly-looking monster by the wrath of the Titans, and takes it upon himself to exact his vengeance on Perseus. However, Perseus's tolls in the journey of love do not end there. With Zeus favoring him and Titans against a Titan, Perseus sets off from one adventure to another, as gods throw a series of supernatural hindrances in Perseus's way, with the journey getting dangerous as deadly beasts from the dreaded Kraken to Medusa get involved, Perseus must overcome every obstacle in his way to win Andromeda's hand and fulfill his destiny. Released before CGI was all the craze, the movie definitely does justice to the heavy theme of Greek mythology. In spite of the plot seeming overused, with the damsel in need of saving and the knight out on adventures, the story flows effortlessly. It never feels monotonous and is adventure-driven. It's visually pleasing, and the splendid cinematography really sets the mood. The attention to detail raised the quality of the movie a few notches. The eerie boat ride on the gloomy, foggy river, the representation of the deadly kraken all heightens the tension of the atmosphere. The background score also complements the air of unease that is felt throughout the movie. The special effects were fantastic, considering the time when the movie was released, and a dash of mythology to the whole concoction makes Clash of the Titans an outstanding feat on its own, in spite of many versions rolled out after this. While the movie on a superficial level showcases the great adventures of Perseus, on a deeper level it emphasizes that even a common, ordinary man can overcome any obstacles thrown his way only if he sets his heart to it. <laughs> Fire and Ice, 1983. Fire and Ice is an animated tale of resilience and perseverance in the face of peril. When evil queen Juliana and her megalomaniac son Necron send forth an ever-growing glacier with the intent to take over the world, a tiny village and its inhabitants are forced to flee south and seek refuge in a city built around a volcano called the Firekeep which is ruled by the compassionate King Gerald. With every second bringing the impending doom closer and the unstoppable glacier swamping everything in its path, the end seems inevitable. Amidst all this, King Jarl's daughter, Princess Tigra, is abducted by the evil Ice Lord, Nacron, but somehow manages to escape and comes across a farm boy, Larn the last survivor of the raised village destroyed by the glaciers. However, Tigra is recaptured, and thus, Larn selflessly sets out on a perilous quest in the heart of the conflict, with wars drawing near on a land crowded with monsters waiting to tear him apart. Larn teams up with a mysterious warrior named Dark Wolf, and begins his fearless search to save the princess, risking both his life and limbs in this good versus evil saga. Though serving the same predictable plot, the movie was colorful and looked pleasant on the big screen. While the animations were a bit choppy by today's standards, it was the action scene that pulled the whole movie together. An out-and-out -out violent movie with a beautiful background and attractive colors. Even though the characters looked too wooden and it was a little difficult to emotionally invest in them, they were well modeled and engaging. The music sets the appropriate mood for the mystical adventure we are taken through. One character that stood out for me was the warrior named Dark Wolf, who is all kind of badass. With nothing new to offer and riddled with cliches, Fire and Ice has stood the test of time and remains a fan favorite. Oh, 
Labyrinth, 1986. Directed by Jim Henson, Labyrinth follows the history of a teenage girl, Sarah, who lives in her own world of fantasy and alluring tales. She is forced to babysit her stepbaby brother, Toby, while her parents are away. When the infant could not stop wailing, in a moment of angst, she wished the goblins could take her brother away. But, as rightly said, be careful what you wish for. Sarah's wishes come true when her brother is taken away by the king of goblins named Jareth. The goblin king has taken Toby to a castle in Goblin City in the middle of a labyrinth, and Sarah has until midnight to save Toby. Thus, Sarah embarks on a quest, making allies on her way to right the wrong and rescue her baby brother from the outward maze. However, nasty and strange creatures crawl the labyrinth, and this might not be as effortless as Sarah's world of fantasy. While the movie received mixed responses upon its release, it not only attracted children, but audiences of all ages. Although the plot of the movie was quite simple, the depth with which every detail was presented made the movie an engrossing watch. The costumes, the look, the feel-good background, and the cheesy humor were all totally 80s. David Bowie as the Goblin King brought life and conviction to the character of the Goblin King, and gave it its own magical spin. While Bowie was spectacular in his role, Sarah's portrayal was equally noteworthy. With naive innocence, Jennifer Connelly manages to enchant the audience with her big green eyes. Also, how can one forget the super adorable baby Toby? It reminds us of simple fables like Snow White, which had magic in every frame, and the same could be said about Labyrinth. This is what has helped the film stand its ground even after all these years. Flash Gordon, 1980. Based on the comic strip of the same name and directed by Mike Hodges, Flash Gordon is a superhero film that starts on Earth, but the adventures take us into outer space. The movie begins with the plane boarded by football star Flash and his travel agent Dale being hit by a meteor. But it was nothing natural. Somewhere, the merciless Emperor Ming of the planet Mongo, out of boredom, begins destroying Earth by causing natural calamities. They're forced to crash land the plane when the pilot dies midair. They land the plane in the backyard of an erratic ex-NASA scientist named Hans Zarkov. A madcap scientist, Zarkov had his own conspiracy theory that the world would soon be under attack by the aliens' forces and thus built his own spaceship to fight the battle against the enemies when the time comes. Zarkov convinces Flash and Dale to join his mission. Although reluctant, both joined the expedition, and the three Earth-bound humans set course to the planet Mongo. Upon their arrival, they come to know that the planet was ruled by the tyrannical Emperor Ming, but are soon taken prisoner. And lo and behold, Zarkov was right. The merciless Ming has been fine-tuning natural disasters and attacking Earth to destroy it. He also intends to take Dale as his wife and execute Flash. Realizing that the Earth is sitting on a ticking bomb, Flash decides to take matters into his own hands. He attempts to unite the kingdom of Mongo, and with the help of new allies like Ming's own daughter, her lover Prince Baron, and a winged warrior named Voltan, Flash must do everything in his power to rescue Dale and save the world. The movie didn't do well upon its release, but years later it was appreciated for its campiness. It's colorful and the film doesn't really make sense, yet it's irresistibly entertaining. Although the performances by everyone are below par, there's something in this movie that does draw you in. It's one of the movies that can be suitably described as being so bad, yet so good. The plot is silly and over the top, and the stoic and wooden performances by everyone involved make Flash Gordon something not to be taken seriously. With no redeeming qualities or anything to be praised, the movie certainly can be called a guilty pleasure, where you don't need to analyze every frame, but just sit back and let Flash save everyone. Conan the Barbarian, 1982. Belonging to the subgenre of sword and sorcery, Conan the Barbarian is a heroic fantasy film directed by John Milius and has the theme of revenge at its heart. Set in the fictional Hyborian Age and millions of years before modern civilization, the film opens with the quote, that which does not kill us makes us stronger, penned by Nietzsche. 
Conan was a young boy when his village was pillaged and his parents brutally murdered by a horde of warriors led by the ruthless Thalsa Doom, a wicked and unruly leader of the Snake Cult. The young boy was then enslaved and tied to a large mill called the Wheel of Pain. The constant years of pushing the large millstone made him hardened and brawny. He finally tastes freedom when he is sold to a new master and trained to be a gladiator. The now free and no longer the same young and naive boy, Conan, sets out on a quest to seek vengeance on Thulsa Doom, the man who massacred his parents in cold blood. On his journey, he meets the Hycranian thief, Subitai, and the Queen of Bandits, Valeria, as the trio embarks on a quest to break into the impregnable snake cult temple and avenge his parents' death. When Conan the Barbarian was released, it was condemned for its violence and sheer brute force. However, years later, it was the same sword fights and action sequences that made it a fan favorite. Arnold Schwarzenegger playing the role of Conan seems tailor-made for him. With a glistening bare chest, rocking a high thigh boot and a naked sword in one hand, and with more muscle in a single arm than an average man has in his whole body, Arnold looks sharp. However, the tone of the movie is somber and gloomy. The film looks put together, and every actor gives a notable performance. One noteworthy performance was delivered by the antagonist, Thalsa Doom, who brings equal parts power and wickedness to the character. Although sometimes too extreme in terms of gore, there is a touch of humor sprinkled around. While the plot of the movie is Conan's revenge, it never lets us forget that he is a product of violence and tragedy. Highlander, 1986. Originally titled Shadow Clan and directed by Russell Mulcahy, Highlander follows Connor McLeod of the Clan McLeod. Although set in the present time, the history of Connor is told through flashback scenes where we learn that our sword-wielding protagonist was born in the 16th century in the Scottish Highlands. However, during a conflict against the Fraser clan, he is mortally wounded at the hands of the villainous Kurgan and dies on the battlefield. He miraculously survived, which, you know, doesn't sit well with his clan, who suspected Connor was in league with the devil and witchcraft and thus banished him from his clan. It is then that Connor meets an Egyptian swordsman who goes by the name Juan Sanchez Villalobos Ramirez. Ramirez mentors Connor, and the resurrected Highlander learns that he belongs to a rare group of humans who possess the power of quickening, which makes them immortal. Although these special humans could not bear children, they had the ability to remain ageless and immortal, and the only way to slay them was a beheading. These immortals can absorb the quickening of another immortal and increase their power by decapitating them. As made evident from the movie's tagline, there can be only one, the immortals battle one another to be the last one standing. Ramirez also informs that when there are only a handful of immortals left, they will be pulled to a faraway land for a final battle in the gathering, where the final man who survives will take the prize, the collected power of all immortals that lived throughout history, and the powers were enough to enslave and rule humankind for eternity. Although the movie had a weak opening, it eventually captured the imaginations of fantasy fanatics with its eloquent swordsplay and unhinged, sometimes unfunny, humor. Despite scathing criticism upon its initial release, the movie found its following decades later. The brilliant camera work and the action scenes were carefully planned and brilliantly executed without seeming too childish and cliché. Every actor brought their A-game. The protagonist, with his long mane and brooding eyes, was swoon-worthy and Kurgan, as the malicious villain, was equally menacing. While the character of Ramirez had a restricted screen presence, the actor playing the role left an everlasting presence. The film is high on energy, and there are rarely any dull moments. The ambitious soundtrack, provided by the rock band Queen, is one to be remembered. It's certainly a great fantasy to watch if we set aside our logic and let our imaginations run wild. Return to Oz, 1985. Loosely based on Frank Baum's books titled The Marvelous Land of Oz and Ozma of Oz, 
Return to Oz, directed by Walter Murch, is a dark fantasy released by Walt Disney Pictures. The story revolves around Dorothy Gale, who has just returned from the land of Oz and has been behaving erratically, according to her Aunt Em. An insomniac, Dorothy, who frequently talks about strange and imaginary places, worries Aunt Em. She decides to consult a special doctor, Dr. Worley, renowned for treating people back to health using electricity and shock therapy treatments. However, not everything is as simple as it sounds. When the famous doctor tries to use his shock treatment on Dorothy to cure her seemingly nasty dreams, she's rescued by a mysterious girl and led back again to Oz, where another adventure awaits her. Once again in Oz, Dorothy finds her pet hen, Belina, who can now talk. But upon searching for her friends in the Emerald City, she soon learns that they have been turned to stones by the wicked Gnome King and his accomplice, Princess Mombi. So now, Dorothy and her bunch of new friends, Jack Pumpkinhead, TikTok, a robot, and the flying couch named Gump, must fight the evil Gnome King and the immoral witch, Princess Mombi, and restore the Emerald City to its past glory which now lies in waste. Although the movie was catering to children, it was as far-reaching as the 1939 classic in terms of tone. Steering clear of the 1939 The Wizard of Oz, which was all rainbows and ponies with everything sugar-coated, colorful, and cheery, The Return to Oz was rather grim and bleak, with no spontaneous chirpy songs breaking out of nowhere. Although the movie stayed true to its source material, L. Frank Baum received mixed responses upon its release for its dark and intense spin on a children's tale. However, the actors played their characters to the T, especially Dorothy Gale, who made her adventures all the more enthralling and exciting. Appreciated for its imaginative plot, the movie was beautifully shot with lovely set designs and costumes with noteworthy special effects. Despite a talking chicken and flying couches, the movie was rather serious and somber. The Return to Oz weaves a grim and mysterious fantasy tale that might just be a little scary for children, but displays an engrossing adventure that is definitely recommended for people who like their fantasy tales topped with a smidge of macabre. Ladyhawk, 1985. A medieval fantasy film directed by Richard Donner, Ladyhawk revolves around a pair of lovers pulled apart by the jealousy of a bishop and a petty thief who helps the ill-starred lovers break an infernal curse. Philippe Gaston, a thief who goes by the nickname The Mouse, is imprisoned in the dungeons of the Bishop of Aquila and sentenced to death. Known for getting out of tight situations and aptly justifying his name, he breaks out of an impregnable prison to obviously avoid his execution. Execution. He's recaptured by the bishop's guards, but is rescued by a knight in black, Etienne Navarre, who was on the run with his beloved Lady Isabeau d'Anjou and hunted by the bishop's forces. It so happened that the bishop lusted over Lady Isabeau, but when his feelings weren't reciprocated, he laid an evil curse on the lovers, which kept them always together, eternally apart. The bishop's black magic cursed the star-crossed lovers, where the lady changes into a hawk while the knight transforms into a wolf at night. The ill-fated pair seeks the thief's help to lift this evil enchantment. With the help of the only prisoner who managed to escape Bishop's mighty fortress, the pickpocket Mouse, Navare plans to break into the well-defended and secured stronghold of the Bishop and overthrow him. But can a thief be trusted in matters of the heart? Set in Italy, Lady Hawk may have a gloomy plot where the lovers, despite being together, can never unite. It draws the viewers in with its endearing characters. The breathtaking visuals of the countryside, mingled with action, excellent cinematography, and just the right amount of humor and romance make the movie universally appealing. Then there's the compelling story and uniformly strong performances. Now, what I personally love about this movie is the use of some super awesome special effects. I mean, real places, real things. What more could you want? <laughs> The Black Cauldron, 1985. Based on Lloyd Alexander's The Chronicles of Prydain, The Black Cauldron is an animated fantasy adventure directed by Ted Berman and Richard Rich. With the story, Disney takes us on a journey centuries ago to the mythical land of Prydain. Here we meet Taryn, a very ordinary and humble pig herder who, like every young man of his day, 
dreamt of glory and accolades. His wish turns true when he is tasked with the safety of Hen Ren, a magical pig with the gift of prophecy who can foresee the future in the water. However, as evil knows no bounds, Hen is kidnapped by the Horned King. Now, this guy plans to use Hen to seek the Black Cauldron's powers and resurrect an invincible army of undead to conquer the world. Taran, along with Princess Ilanwi, a bard named Fluter Flem, and a lovable furry but mischievous creature, Gurgi, sets out to thwart the Horned King's grand schemes of world dominance. The largely good versus evil movie is also a coming-of-age movie, where the protagonist, Taran, plunges into a quest to stop a powerful king's plans. With this movie, Disney aimed to attract teenagers, yet it failed to achieve what it had hoped for. The movie received mixed critical reactions, but years later, it earned its own fan base. While the movie falls short in humor and creating an emotional connection usually found in Disney's projects, the animation was worth making the movie more than watchable. Also, the movie was a watered-down version of the books it was based on, as it didn't fully embrace the dark and gloomy tonality. I mean, it was a Disney film from the 1980s after all. Nevertheless, despite all its shortcomings, The Black Cauldron has its own visual flair and is ambitious storytelling. Well, that was all in this one. Let me know which ones are your favorites. Oh, and I'd love to know if you have any suggestions. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks, everyone.